just so we are Okay, Bismillah. Uh, good evening and welcome. I believe we are live currently, uh, both here on Zoom and on Facebook. Uh, to care for the Facebook page. Uh, we are uh, honored tonight to host Amir Qasim Rashad of United Muslim Masjid, United Muslim Movement. Um, uh, and um, I'm just going to say a few words. My name is Ahmed Tekedolo. I am Education Outreach Director at Care Philadelphia, and I'm joined tonight to run the program together with me uh, by uh, Sanai Parker, uh, Care Philadelphia's community organizer, uh, one of the, the, our youth, our future, mashallah. Um, and so the plan for tonight is, you know, it's with Emmer Qasim, we are going to have a lively com conversation on not only the United Muslim Masjid, but he is one of the leading Muslim um, names in Philadelphia, um, public intellectual, also um, a community leader. So we're going to exchange ideas around, you know, the moment that we are living in um, and, um, and the, the Black History Month in general. Um, this series uh, hopes to bring not only further attention to the, the deep entrenched legacies and histories of our uh, leading institutions, uh, but at the same time to share perspectives um, uh, on uh, on our moment. So, Emir Kassim, thank you so much, Ustad, for giving us your very valuable time. And I uh, would love to welcome everyone. And we just wanted to note that, you know, please um, use, if you are joining us on Zoom, the chat or the Q&A buttons to post your questions. Uh, and if you are joining us on Facebook too, you can put down your questions in the comment section uh, so that, you know, we can convey those to, to Emir Kassim. Um, so thank you so much again and, uh, and welcome. Our first uh, question will be really a request to, to get to know you a little bit more and maybe on a more uh, personal level. Uh, we are uh, always very curious to, to hear the personal stories of our uh, guests, our leaders. Um, just let us walk through your personal story a little bit, uh, yeah. if you may. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Shadow in the Hibaba Wahdu, La Shikala, Shadow and Muhammad Abdu, Rasubu, Muhammad Ba. First, I want to say thank you for uh, choosing me. I feel very honored. I don't know if I'm deserving of such an honor, but uh, I accept it because uh, I have a great deal of fondness for care and a lot of respect for Jacob Bender and yourself. Um, I was uh, a child of the 60s born in, in, in 61, uh, growing up in uh, North Philadelphia, uh, spent some of my childhood in Paris, France. Uh, as a military brat, my first schooling was actually in the Paris American Academy uh, in France. And uh, upon returning uh, my family from, uh, from Europe, uh, that's when I encountered my um, uncle, um, Ismail Shaba, uh, Sabakan, Ismail Khalid Sabakan, who was uh, a Muslim, a minister in the uh, old nation of Islam. And uh, he was a great influence upon me and my brothers. Um, and he was charged with the ministry. He toured uh, uh, through Atlanta and Miami and so on and so forth. He was there when uh, the then Cassius Clay, uh, who tran transformed into Muhammad Ali. Uh, he was in that mosque in Miami at that time. So he was always teaching us about, uh, the first time I heard the words, Allah, Muhammad, Quran, Islam, uh, was from him. And uh, so growing up, I was familiar with that nomenclature of Islam. And so uh, going to high school, I think I made a conscious decision uh, after growing up, uh, wasn't growing up in the church, but went to church. My mother was the daughter of a, uh, a Baptist minister. And so she made sure that we went to church. 
but there was something based on the seeds that my uncle uh, planted in me uh, that did not quite reconcile me to the Christian faith. Uh, and so I started exploring Islam first with actually, you know, this is before obviously the internet, I used Encyclopedia Britannica and I looked up Islam. I did a research paper in high school. And then that is when I knew um, I came to the realization that uh, Islam would become my form or my expression of faith. Uh, went on to uh, college in the eighties uh, at uh, Dillard, in, uh, Dillard University in New Orleans. And in there, I was reunited uh, with my uncle. He lived in uh, New Orleans at the time. And so we used to sit and talk, you know, all the time about uh, Islam. At this point, it was post-1975. So he was a member of the Nation of Islam from the 50s. And then when Imam Warfi Muhammad uh, came into leadership, he made the transition into uh, the world community of Islam with Imam Wafi Muhammad. And his thing was, he always, now mind you, I wasn't a Muslim, but uh, very interested. He always talked about he and I making Hajj. And so he, he told me, you know, some of the old nation that, that uh, Mecca was a city paved with uh, streets of gold. And so that was my first encounter or understanding. And so I became more and more interested. Um, I graduated in 83, I returned home in 86. Uh, so around 1991, I formally took my Shahada. And I took my Shahada at uh, Masjid Allah on the first day of Ramadan uh, in 1991. And I did it with a brother by the name of Hakeem Amir. Uh, he was the Imam, he was the assistant Imam. He, Rahimullah, has since returned to Allah Ta'ala. Uh, he was my brother-in-law at the time. Um, and I remember him telling me, or I'm, you know, I said, well, I don't know. I still had uh, some, some issues. To be frank, I was still a smoker of cigarettes. I had a bad cigarette habit. And I said, no, nah, I, I, I want to, stop smoking cigarettes before I take shahad. He said, you might go out here and get struck by a bus. And if you believe there's no God but Allah, Muhammad is his messenger, then take your shahada and then deal with your issues through Islam, uh, which is what I did. And uh, I quit smoking shortly thereafter. I think I quit smoking during Ramadan and just kept it up. Was you called it like cold turkey, like that? No, it wasn't cold. Well, it was cold turkey, but I used uh, back then that the patch had just been invented, so I used the patch. But it was cold turkey, um, and I was successful. And uh, I haven't smoked a cigarette since you know that was uh, like thirty some odd years ago. And so I went to Hajj two years later. I actually I was born uh, Eric Knox. And uh, back then, we formally changed our names. I changed my name to, I went down to City Hall, filed the papers, changed my name to uh, Qasim Rashad, uh, and went to Hajj in, in, in 1993, you know. And then uh, I come back, and I was a solid, uh, uh, hardcore member at Masjid Allah uh, from 93 to about 95, 96. Um, I was an assistant imam. Uh, I was the treasurer of the masjid. And uh, then we started an organization called the Islamic Family Center. Uh, myself, Dr. Salman Youssef, Salih Abdul Raouf, uh, Sister Rashida um, uh, Hassan, and uh, Brother Ahmed Sabra. Uh, the five of us started uh, the Islamic Family Center. I believe it's now. Uh, Masjid Muxinim on Broad Negro, but we were at mm -hmm. uh, Old York Road for many, many years. Uh, when I was at the Islamic Family Center, we formed a coalition of Masajid, uh, and that coalition uh, was the um, Kuba Masjid, uh, which is on uh, Lancaster Avenue, um, the Islamic Family Center, which was on Old York Road, and United Muslim Masjid on 15th Street. Um, and it was, it was a really uh, forward-thinking group. 
uh, with Brother Kenny Gamble, a.k.a. Uh, Lukman Abdul Haq, um, the, the brothers from the Family Center, the Muhaymin brothers, uh, Dr. Khalid Blankenship, uh, Sultan Ahmed, Michael Rashid. Uh, it was really a literal who's who of forward thinkers uh, of, in Islam in the city. Um, unfortunately, that uh, coalition dissolved uh, and I remained uh, with United Muslim Masjid as a, a member and a board member there. Although I still uh, worshiped and supported and helped at the Islamic Family Center, but my home became uh, United Muslim Masjid. Uh, and I was with United Muslim Masjid probably uh, from 97 or 98 to uh, present day. Uh, in 2008, uh, I was blessed to make Hajj again. My uncle, the uncle that I was telling you about, Ismail Khalid Sabakan, he called me uh, in 2007 and he says, it's time to go. And I'm like, where uncle? He says, we got to make Hajj. Uh, my wife has returned to Allah to Isla and um, I have to do this. I have to complete this. So I said, yes, I didn't have any money at the time, <laughs> but Allah Ta'ala blessed me uh, with, with the resources uh, at that time. And he and I went to Hajj. Um, and it was really such a, a blessing uh, to go and make Hajj with him. Um, I didn't know at the time uh, that he was, he was blind. Um, he could see, but probably no more than five feet in front of him. And he was, he was sick, he was very sick. I didn't know that part either. Um, I found out he was blind when he wandered off and we lost him for a day. And then we found him again. Um, I found out he was sick when we got to Arafah on the 9th of Dhul Hijj. Uh, he was no longer himself, but everyone in our, in our uh, Hajj group and our group was maybe 200 people. Um, I think it was Dar Islam, um, or it was Adam Travel, I believe. And uh, everyone was calling him uncle because he was 85 by then. You know, how is uncle? And everyone's checking on him. How is uncle? How is uncle? How is uncle? And they saw him uh, kind of deteriorate on Arafat. And so when we got back to Mecca, I did the, the farewell to us with him uh, in a wheelchair. Alhamdulillah. Uh, when we got home, uh, the uh, we had to go straight to the hospital. We went to University of Penn, and then the doctors told me, "Do you know that your uncle was very ill? He has cancer, and he sustated he sustated his chemo treatments before going to Hajj." And the doctor told him, "If you do this, then you're going to get sick." But he was like, that was what I wanted to do. That was his last wish. And we fulfilled that for him, inshallah. And so the seven brothers who we uh, went to Hajj with, some brothers from Masjid uh, Mujahideen, 60th Street Masjid, actually. Uh, that's who was in my immediate group. We all flew down to uh, Florida and performed the Salat al-Janazah for my uncle, uh, alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. And... Um, that is probably one of the most touching stories <laughs> uh, that I have. So come full circle, I come back, uh, Amir um, Lukman um, uh, retired from United Muslim Masjid and um, I succeeded him after another brother. And so now I've been placed in the position of Amir of the United Muslim Masjid. And so we have since brought on uh, two very dynamic brothers, um, and that's uh, Sheikh uh, Dr. Tahir Wyatt, who is uh, probably he's Hafiz. Both of these brothers are Hafiz, Hafiz of Quran. Imam Hani Faus, um, very dynamic brothers. We never had two Imams at the same time, but it actually really worked out well for us uh, because the two in tandem can really help and support the community in the way uh, a community is really meant to be supported. Um, I think Dr. White is the first African-American to teach 
at the Prophet's Mosque in Medina. Um, I don't think he's the first African American to receive a PhD from Medina, but he is among them. There are not many who have completed that. Uh, but what is so magnificent or great about this group of brothers when they sat down with us, uh, they said, look, we want to put forth a 10, 20 year plan on how to grow the community and so and teach the community. And they look at uh, Islam not as a doctoral thesis, but as a community and as a ministry. And so the people are their primary concern, educating the people, supporting the people, particularly in their time of need. Um, when there's a death, Imam is at someone's house. If there's someone that's sick prior to COVID, he would be visiting them, you know, in the hospital. I would go visit people and I said, well, I'm gonna make sure the Imam, the Imam was here two days ago. So, <laughs> mashallah. And so we've grown as a community and we've become far more stable. Uh, I think this is even in spite of COVID uh, in 2021, I'm so proud of what United Muslim Masjid, fondly known as UMM, has become. And I don't know if many folks know, we have two locations, two sites, one at 1251 Point Breeze, uh, which is United Muslim Islamic Center. Uh, and we have United Muslim Masjid, ironically at 15th and Christian, but who knows if we can get that name changed, at least the block to 15th and uh, Muslim way or Islamic way, inshallah. inshallah. No, this is this is this is wonderful. Yeah, and I think you know this next set of questions from Sanai. I think will give us a little bit more. I think you touched on where your story intersects with the UMM story, but a little bit more about the UMM and its history. Over to you, Sanai. Yeah, mm -hmm. alhamdulillah. Thank you, thank you so much again, brother, for um, for sharing that story with us. That was a very, very touching story um, about your uncle, and. You, like Brother Ahmed said, had already kind of brief, like briefly mentioned how that story intertwined with UMM and its long history. So my next follow-up questions were going to be about UMM and how your story intersected um, with it. And also more so, like, could you tell us more about the history behind UMM and its two locations and like that sort, like, that sort of aspect? Okay. Uh, UMM uh, came about with a group of brothers from South Philadelphia, um, a brother named Abdullah uh, Saba. They used to pray at his house on uh, Ellsworth Street uh, in South Philly. Now we're located at 15th and Christian, so uh, Ellsworth is on Broad Street. You know, I think his address might have been 14 or 12, 11 uh, Ellsworth. So not far from the masjid. And those brothers used to uh, gather and have jumwa in his home. Uh, they came to uh, a brother by the name of Kenny Gamble, uh, who was a long time uh, Muslim in the community. Um, he's of uh, Gamble and Huff Records, uh, Philadelphia International Records. So he had, a, he had means and he had property. So he owned actually the block that we are on uh, from 801 uh, 15th Street all the way to um, hmm, 820 or something, that entire side of the block, both sides of the block. And so he offered uh, 810 and uh, 808 Christian Street as a place to pray. And so we started at um, 810. Uh, 15th Street started praying in there with those same group of brothers and they broke ground and they rehabilitated the thing, the building, uh, made it what it was. And then they expanded into 808 because of the capacity, uh, started a community uh, CDC, Universal um, Community Homes, which was a CDC. Uh, and that was to be our CDC arm uh, to help develop the community. They started housing and charter schools and things of like that. And so the community uh, began to, to form in jail. So much so that they managed to um, 
the Universal Institute Charter School and all those buildings around there, they were um, abandoned, blighted. All these buildings were ab abandoned and blighted. And the Muslims took those buildings over, rehabilitated them, turned them into schools and houses and a masjid. And so that started to drive and push the blight, but all of the uh, crime and nefarious things that are associated with blighted communities out of that area. And so they, they have to be, or we have to be credited with cleaning up that community. But at the same time, the other side was that once we removed all of that blight and crime, then came the speculators. And, and now you see the gentrifiers and you see homes that, and buildings that we rehabilitated and they were worth maybe $50,000. They're worth a million, two million now. And so if you didn't get in on the ground level, um, then it's very difficult. And then it's also difficult for those who were living in those areas who lived in $50,000 homes to afford the tax base or the temptation of selling their homes. The community is very much diverse. Uh, we attracted a lot of people to our masjid. And I like to think of our masjid almost as like a United Nations uh, situation. If you come to Jumu'ah or any prayer prior to COVID, of course, uh, you will find brothers from uh, the Maghrib area, from North Africa, from West Africa, from East Africa, from Southeast Asia, um, Caucasian brothers, African-American brothers, um, it is a very well, it's probably one of the most diverse and well mixed communities in the entire city. And we're about 10 blocks uh, from uh, City Hall. So, you know, we have a lot of brothers who, um, who uh, support their families by driving uh, Uber and cabs. So there's always someone there praying. Uh, from Fedra, you'll, I've been to various masajid in the city. You come to United Muslim Masjid and it's packed at Fedra. You come near Doha, the afternoon prayer is packed. You go there at Isha, it's packed. Um, we, we started one of the first traditions of feeding everyone during the month of Ramadan. So you can come to United Muslim Masjid, particularly when it's in the warmer months um, and you get a full course meal. We don't give you some dates and water and tell you to go somewhere else after. Uh, we have the dates and water, we make our salah, and we come back and we have a full course meal and all mm -hmm. are welcome. We've set up chairs and tables and it's just a big community event. Uh, we've gotten a lot of support from the 17th district. So we invite the, the 17th district over, you know, and make sure that all the Muslim brothers who are, who are police officers in the 17th district police station, that they get fed, the captain of the station gets fed, and we send meals over to them uh, for the police officers that cannot come join us. And that's just like one night uh, that we have. We also have a situation where we put up a calendar during the month of Ramadan and people actually literally bump heads and fight to, uh, if you write your name in the calendar, then you're feeding the people for that day. And often we have two or three families filling up that calendar. And so there are certain families that uh, cook certain meals that people kind of look forward to, and they mark that down. The Khans are one that give, uh, you know, I think they slaughter an entire cow. And so you can, you can look forward to jerk barbecue baked uh, or, or beef, and so people look out for these. The Jawala Scouts, um, we hired Brother um, Hussein uh, from 60th Street, Imam Asim's, Hussein Abdul Rashid, uh, Imam Asim's son, and he brings his big barbecue grill out, and we just make a whole festival, you know, um, out of it. So uh, United Muslim Masjid is ingrained in the Islamic DNA of South Philadelphia, and Philadelphia, because when we're having these big iftars, people come from uh, all over the city to join us. And we're just so happy to have them. And that tradition has picked up and, and Masjid Allah has something very similar every night. And so other masajid have the same thing. So, you know, Muslims, you know, I, I guess in, in the Christian world, they, you go from house to house on one day, Christmas day. 
And in the Muslim world during Ramadan, it's every night for 29 or 30 days and even the Eid uh, after that. So our intersection, and, and we're very proud of our little uh, corner masjid. Uh, we're at capacity. And with the two brothers that we have, uh, Imam Hanif Faust and Dr. Sheikh uh, Tahir Wyatt, uh, we have classes every Tuesday, every Thursday, and every Friday and every Sunday. So um, we're pretty much robust in terms of our community life and our intersection in the city. And all are welcome. Uh, one of, the, one of the, the sponsors of one of our better uh, iftars is um, uh, our state representative, Harris. Uh, he comes out and he sponsors an iftar. Other people, like I said, sponsor uh, iftars. So everyone is welcome to the masjid. We don't kind of like discriminate, and say, oh, if you're not a Muslim, you can't come eat with us. Wonderful. Uh, I, I can definitely <laughs> testify for that too, because I remember growing up and I was involved in Jawala Scouts when I was younger. We would come to UMM, and even though we were all the way up at Masjid Allah, we would still come every Ramadan um, for that for one of those iftars, and I just remember how, just how packed it was. Like you said, it was packed like to the brim. People were outside, like in the playground, across the street. Like it was just full of people, and just seeing like that whole community come together for that, and just hearing about how you guys have been able to to serve the community, the Muslim community as a whole in Philadelphia. Alhamdulillah, that is. Very, very beautiful. Thank you. Indeed, indeed. Alhamdulillah. Uh, for, the, for all you do, for our audience's sake, I'm just going to put down, maybe people have already Googled, but here is the, the website for UMM. Uh, you can track the, the classes, the, the information uh, at ummonline.org. Um, and mashallah. Uh, like like Amir Qasim said, you know, uh, quite a bit of you know online activity, and and I would have to say that, you know, I think one of the the, the better websites and and social media and online presence uh, in the broader uh, masjid landscape as well. Um, we do so have PayPal we, donation buttons. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. That should not be uh, that should not be forgotten. It's it, it's it's I mean, uh, for those of us, you know, during COVID, right? So the when, when the khutbahs are online and all, uh, mashallah, yes, all of, you know, all the, of our the community really supports as well. Right. All uh, of our khutbahs are, are streamed live online, uh, at, are streamed on Facebook every Friday. And our classes are streamed on YouTube on Tuesday nights and Thursday nights and Friday nights. Uh, we, we do the, uh, the YouTube platform because there, it, there are a lot of folk who don't have Facebook. And so we decided or elected to stay with Facebook for Jumwa because we have a greater deal of control and it just worked out uh, better for us that way. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so, so I think you again, uh, both while talking about your personal history and talking about you, yeah, mentioned this. The next sort of big question is how do you leave Philadelphia's unique place in the broader African-American Muslim history um, across the nation. Now, you, you mentioned that you're a North Philly, um, as, as a young man in North Philly, to experiencing you know, some of the, the days of you know, the old nation, uh, then the 90s, 2000s, as, as you have walked us through. Um, if, if you can take us back a little bit to that, both you know, the diversity of the Muslim landscape within uh, Philadelphia, um, in line with your experiences, but also you have mentioned, for example, the, um, uh, the Islamic Family Center, the, the efforts to come together across different masajid. Um, I think all of these are quite um, interesting and we could talk hours and hours on any right. one single of these. I realize that, mm -hmm. but if you can share with us your perspective as someone um, who has a radio show, who is involved in the civic life in the city, um, as well as being involved with other organizations like Muslim Wellness Foundation um, uh, and all. How do you evaluate uh, Philadelphia's Muslim um, 
history in the broader picture? Well, I, I think I would be doing a, a disservice if I didn't um, mention the Quba Masjid. I think back then it was called the International Brotherhood or uh, Masjid, uh, Masjid Ikhwan. Um, and um, Sheikh Muhaymin, uh, Imam Anwar, Nafi Muhaymin, uh, Imam Anwar's father was one of the founders of the Ikhwan, of the, uh, the International Brotherhood Masjid, prior to it becoming or evolving into uh, Masjid Quba, uh, always an organization dedicated to learning uh, the Quran and teaching it. Uh, and then across the street was the uh, Philadelphia Masjid slash Sister Claire Muhammad School. Um, and uh, so when I became a Muslim, both of those institutions, those hallmark benchmark institutions were very much in play. Um, like I said, I joined Masjid Allah in uh, 1991. Um, and for, for our audience who may not be familiar, the current Masjidullah, uh, we are not talking about the, that, the same right. community, but different same locations. Community, yes. and Masjidullah was, was located at 7700 uh, Ogans Avenue. Uh, I think it was a haberdashery, a, a hat store, a, a fashion store prior to that. Um, and they grew out of uh, the Philadelphia Masjid. Um, the... Um, uh, Masjid Mujahideen wasn't always at 60th and Pine. Uh, you know, many of the masjids uh, are fondly known. I, you know, Philadelphia is territorial. So we're known as the 15th Street Masjid. Uh, Masjid Mujahideen is 60th Street Masjid. Um, the uh, Germantown Masjid, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> they're always often... Uh, affectionately known by their uh, locations. But uh, when I took Shahada, um, the, what's unique about Philadelphia is that most of the Muslims or the presence of Muslims was by and large African-American. You couldn't throw a rock without hitting a black Muslim in Philadelphia. And it's pretty much uh, <laughs> the same way. Um, and so, but there may have been 15, 20 Masajid in 1991. Um, and they all knew each other. I think there may be 60 or 70 in the greater Philadelphia area uh, today. Um, and they all had some tie outside of Islam uh, that bound them together. Everyone knew each other. Everyone had common experiences. Everyone either uh, knew each other from their previous Muslim life or they came through the nation together, or they came through the, um, the Dar Islam movement, um, or through Imam uh, Muhammad's, Warthi Muhammad's community, as, a, as in my case. Um, but what I found different about Philadelphia, and which probably still holds true, that most of the Muslims and most of the Muslim presence uh, of the Islamic presence in Philadelphia was African-Americans. Um, it's changing somewhat because you got uh, the Al-Aqsa Masjid, you have um, Hidayah Masjid, um, and then you have some other Masjid in the surrounding area that are growing and up and coming. But in 91, those Masjid weren't either in play or prominently in play. And uh, so when you go to cities like, uh, when you went to cities like uh, New York, or you went to Virginia or Maryland, it was reverse. Um, the, the, the by and large uh, community were um, immigrant uh, communities or second generation uh, immigrant communities. Whereas in Philadelphia, it had always been um, a large presence of African-Americans. And I don't know if people know this in the history, but uh, Minister Malcolm X was appointed uh, as a minister here in Philadelphia uh, at Temple Number no. 7, which is now the Mecca Masjid at uh, Broad and Susquehanna, uh, and then evolved and became, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Number no. 12, Temple Number no. 12. Seven's in, 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 in Harlem, in New York, and that's Malcolm, Masjid Malcolm Shabazz, 
uh, but uh, number 12 is affectionately known as top of the clock. Uh, but there were all, there was 12A, B, C, E. Uh, there were several uh, branches off of that. I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Mujahideen, um, Cumberland uh, in North Philly. Uh, and of course, Sister Claire Muhammad of Philadelphia, Manchajid. Uh, so there was always a deep presence of an African-American flavor of Islam in Philadelphia. Iman Warfi Muhammad was even point, appointed as uh, a minister here um, for number 12 as well in Philadelphia. Both of those two great leaders um, taught here in Philadelphia, had ties here in Philadelphia. And some of the, what we call the pioneers uh, can rem reminisce fondly uh, on on that. I, I personally uh, met Imam Warfi Muhammad on several occasions. I was a, um, a, a adjunct writer for a Muslim Journal back then. And uh, I, I, I had the opportunity, the, the benefit and privilege to interview Imam Warfi Muhammad and have some uh, very up and close personal conversations uh, with Imam uh, Warfi Muhammad. Obviously I was too young to meet Minister Malcolm X, Al Haj Malik Shabazz, uh, but I did uh, know and meet uh, Imam Warfi Muhammad. And I also have met, uh, I was also a member of American Muslim Council down in Washington, D.C. And mm -hmm. Imam Jamil El Amin and Imam Warfi Muhammad were both board members on AMC. AMC, I think, is by and large, um, that was a uh, brother founded at um, Mahmoud Alamudi. Um, uh, he's no longer. Well, he's, he got caught up in some of the uh, homeland security issues, uh, but they closed AMC down. But I uh, met uh, Imam Jamil El Amin uh, as well, because he was a board member of uh, the American Muslim Council. And so those two brothers worked together, you know. Uh, I guess that was more or less the kind of the precursor to MANA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which mashallah these days is is, is having a, a big comeback, so to speak, yes. uh, really nice. a revival of right with uh, Imam Siraj Wahaj. Indeed, indeed, and like Imam Imam Zaid, I think they are uh, mm -hmm. lifting uh, Amana up, which which we we all should celebrate, support, and learn from, um, inshallah. But yeah. Yeah, well, uh, can, Philly, can the Muslims take also, uh, yeah. you know, credit for the the Philly beard and, and some uh -huh. other cultural institutions? Yeah, they call, uh -huh. Freeway said, no, that's the Prophet Muhammad, but they call it the freeway some places. Uh, but going back to MANA, MANA's first two conferences was held at United Muslim Messenger. Uh, and, and like Brother Lukman Abdul Haq, uh, Kenny Gamble was a big, big supporter of MANA. And there was much discussion. MANA had originally agreed to uh, headquarter uh, in Philadelphia with um, Sheikh Iksan Bagby. Uh, that just never uh, came about. Uh, but that was, MANA was going to be at United Muslim, was going to be in South Philly, inshallah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure we'll, we'll go into some of the details of Mm -hmm. uh, some of what, what you have. I'm just uh, amazed that I can remember some of these names and I'm getting old. <laughs> I'm, mm -hmm. I'm remembering some of these names. Some of them I draw a blank on, some of them I do remember. Those were good times. Indeed, well, I come to that for, for that. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to some of these, but uh, I'll pass over to Sanai for our next question, Shal. Yeah, alhamdulillah. Um, so that once again, it ties into pretty much what, what we wanted to ask next, which is about just the conversation of race and religion in general, um, specifically for, you know, Philadelphia. And like you said, how Philadelphia has been, you know, majority African American Muslim um, for such a long time and how both of those things connected, you know, have played a big part in the history um, of the city and the history of the Islamic community in the city. So we were just at, gonna ask um, how the broader conversation of race and religion sort of echo with that story or with UMM 
and with what you've experienced mm -hmm. um, in your time? Well, at United Muslim Masjid, because we are so centrally located, um, we've been very diverse from the onset. Uh, in Philadelphia, you may hear some folks say that there are racial, there is racial tension uh, in Islam uh, because sometimes they may get the perception that um, our brothers, um, our Arab brothers may not be as sensitive to African American concerns and vice versa, or South Asians and so on and so forth. Um, however, uh, I can honestly say, and then with our uh, our new imam, our resident imam and his resident scholars, they have such a command of the Arabic language. They have really done, um, made a concerted effort to make everyone feel comfortable. And although um, uh, Philadelphia has been by and large, uh, a large African-American Muslim community, the burgeoning um, immigrant or Arab or South Asian community uh, is growing. And I think we really uh, came together or really knew that we had to rely upon one another in, uh, during 9-11 uh, when, and I think this was kind of a wake up call <laughs> for, our, for our Arab brothers, you know, when they finally, um, you know, sometimes you achieve a certain level of success and so sometimes you, you may be deluded or you may get a false impression that the privilege is extended. But 9-11 let all Muslims know that they are in a special designated category. And so once we realize that we're all in this together, um, I think that we worked well together. Uh, the, some of the main targets uh, post 9-11 were, uh, some of our Arab institutions or our immigrant uh, mosque. And so they relied upon the strength uh, and the connections that we have within the city politically, uh, institutionally, uh, and even within law enforcement uh, to help bolster and support. And they were calling us and look, you know, we're being threatened. I think the Al-Aqsa Masjid um, one time had a uh, uh, I don't know if it will be a, a race hate or a religious intimidation act where someone threw a pig's head at the masjid. And some of the, and that was a, that was a signal. That was an overt uh, terroristic threat. And quite naturally, some of the, uh, the brothers from the African-American masjids that have these kinds of uh, security trainings went straight to the masjid and said, we're gonna protect the masjid because this is a law's house. And we're not going to tolerate that. And so race relations uh, in Philadelphia uh, have been by and large uh, very peaceful. Uh, we have a burgeoning, burgeoning or a growing West African uh, Muslim community, particularly in Southwest and West Philadelphia. I think there may be four Masajid that are African and, and they come to our, our masjid, we go to their masjid. And so um, I don't want to say or sound as if we've achieved Islamic utopia because we still can be tribal at times. Um, but I think the imama, uh, the imams in Philadelphia have done an excellent job at um, keeping a balance within the, the differences of um, uh, race and perhaps the perception of, of, of racial tensions. I know at United Muslim Masjid, um, pre-COVID and throughout our history, we have had um, brothers from the Latino community, from the South Asian community, from the Arab community, all over the world come and give khutbah and teach and no one blink an eye. And as long as he's teaching Quran, uh, and Sunnah, his race uh, never ma never matters. As a matter of fact, our um, uh, our Khatib, uh, and this I'm going to draw a blank because I can't remember Sheikh's name right now, is an Egyptian brother. 
uh, and he's been leading us in the Tawari prayers for the last 10 years or so. And when these brothers came and said, okay, we're, we're Hafiz and we're Imam, um, but we want to continue with the tradition that uh, the Sheikh has and that you all have a, a Qari, who is an Egyptian brother, who leads the Tawari prayers and has led them. So they never tried to displace him, you know, and he's an older brother and they yield to him. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh, walhamdulillah, and so on and so forth. So, you know, can it be better? Sure. But is it bad? No, not at all. Yeah, thank you, Seth. And, and I think, you know, um, like you said, uh, one of the, um, the, I think, you know, distinctive points is is you all being able to cultivate community and you've, you've emphasized how much attention mm -hmm. at, at UMM you have put in, uh, into that and how intentional uh, you have been. And I think that's, that's an aspect that, that many communities um, that we all either belong to or visit, you know, have, have, have long ways to do. And it is one of the more difficult aspects of this okay. to achieve it and to, to, be, to be able to also properly talk about, you know, these difficult conversations uh, that I think are are, are much uh, much needed, and obviously, like you've you've mentioned, I think there is also the broader, like segregation, uh, geographic, socioeconomic realities that that mar much of Philadelphia um, and issues. So, uh, as as an urban masjid um, who um, continues to serve, you know, the community, be present. Um, I wanted to add this question, maybe this wasn't in our list, but um, issues like the gun violence that's in Philadelphia, uh, some of the other uh, aspects that is impacting Philadelphia, as someone who's active in the broader civic landscape, including city landscape, you know, I remember, I believe it was last year, um, a city, you know, hall commendation uh, for the mischief as well uh, took place. What are some ways that the masjid, as you have highlighted in you know, the cleaning up of the, the neighborhoods and other aspects have been contributing to or shaping some of these conversations? Uh, gun violence, um, gentrification, uh, many other um, issues. Like you said, UMM is just 10 blocks from the city hall um, and South Philadelphia is probably one of those areas that's, that's really um, being impacted at multiple levels by these developments. Yes, uh, South Philly, Philadelphia has been tragically impacted uh, by gun violence. Um, and our masjid has had to um, intercede and negotiate even uh, peace treaties. Some of these uh, situations go back generations. And so when you talk to uh, our youth, uh, and then if you try to intercede, you know, you have what they call, quote unquote, the old heads come talk to the youth to stop the, the violence. Um, they say, well, you know, um, your father killed my father, your uncle shot my uncle. And so these um, turf wars have been going on in Philadelphia for uh, many, many years. Um, the fact that some of them, I don't wanna use the word many of them, but a good number of them uh, have been, the gun violence has been represented as victims and perpetrators by Muslims. Uh, this is just a fact. Um, now our Imams have always maintained you know, an open door policy uh, where we can talk to these youth. Um, but I think we all feel overwhelmed. I think they had eight homicides over the weekend in Philadelphia. We're at an all time high in terms of gun violence. You know, and I think I saw something on uh, a meme on uh, social media that said, you know, killing each other is like killing soldiers in your own army. Uh, it's a very sad situation um, that we can play a greater role in. The entire uh, religious community can do more 
Um, and we, we have to make those concerted efforts. We've lost young men in our masjid uh, to gun violence. Um, we've, even during Ramadan, we've had young men going home from uh, Tawari prayers and be killed, you know? And it's a sad fact, uh, but it is not relegated to Islam, but at the same time, Muslims can do more because I think we have more quote unquote street cred uh, than many other. We have such a big youthful population. This and I is an example of uh, young Muslims, you know, and I think probably our conversion rate is probably for young people higher than any other faith or denomination, you know, in the city. Uh, young people are and always have been attracted uh, to Islam since the days of uh, Minister Malcolm X and Cassius Clay, you know, and you still see young people um, coming into uh, Islam, rappers particularly coming into Islam, and they can have an impact, but they're attracted for something, for a reason. And so we have to use what we know to help the youth, uh, even if they aren't Muslims, because Islam has such a potent and a major influence. There's nothing, I mean, you, you can see young people um, hanging out on the corners with their pants cut off in the Salafi style, big beards and uh, the oversized shirts covering their butts and a cross hanging around their neck, you know, but the influence and the style came from Muslims, you know? And so now you see uh, young folk, old folk with orange and red beards. Again, that's an influence from uh, Muslims on the greater community. And we had a fashion label called Meskeen a few years back, and that was very popular. Um, with the rappers. And so Islam has the potential and the possibility to help sustain, reform, and play a role. Many of the, what they call interrupters, uh, I think there's a group called the No Gun Zone. You can follow them on Instagram. A lot of those brothers uh, um, are Muslims. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Seth, for, for your insightful comments on this. And I'll pass to Sanai, but one of the things that was on my mind was to also ask you to, to talk a little bit about the, the role and the space of women um, in the UMM community and, and the, the role that they, uh, they play. Uh, I think you have also established some really cultural institutions that are run by the sisters of the, the community. Yeah. So um, we'd, we'd love to hear a little bit about, about that as well before. Um, our, sisters, our sisters play a very integral part uh, in our community, in our community development. Um, we do have an active, uh, well, we're, we're living in different times, but we did have an active uh, uh, Girl Scout group called um, Muslim Scouts. Um, we have uh, sisters who uh, teach. Right now, currently, um, uh, our imam is developing a core of sisters for, for the purpose of teaching women. Uh, women are welcome uh, at United Muslim Masjid. They have their own place, their own space. We just completed the renovation of our sister's voodoo station to accommodate uh, a greater number of women, as you can realize, being in two row houses stacked, placed together, our space is very limited. Uh, and so when we went from, when we were previously a one day Jumwa community, that was okay. But now that we tend to have more services uh, for them. So we uh, expanded into a community group called Aging with Dignity that is headed up by Sister Rokaya. Ali is one of the, the, the lead persons uh, with that. We have the um, Muslim Youth Group, uh, which is headed up by Sister Hanan. And this is a very dynamic group. 
and it's composed of Muslim youth uh, headed up by a sister. But what's different about this, um, the Muslim youth group, is that we ask the youth, what do you want to be taught? And we can get Muslims to teach from an Islamic perspective. And so, you know, in the era of uh, cryptocurrency and all of this, they say, well, we want to know about investing in finance. We want to know self-defense. So we brought on a brother, um, uh, Salim, who does uh, safety, gun safety training and target practicing. Uh, they also wanted their driver's license. So we brought on a, a program for driver's education. And so these, as opposed to us saying, hey, you know what? We think we know what kids want. <laughs> and we shove it down their throats. Uh, we said, no, give us five programs um, that uh, you would like to see us bring to you. And they did. And so the sisters uh, at our master, uh, Sister Fatima Gamble, uh, who is like the first lady of United Muslim Masjid, Brother Kenny Gamble's wife, uh, does the Heads Up the Wellness of You program, uh, the Men's Wellness Program, which is an annual program that's very beneficial uh, to uh, men, particularly men who are aging, who need to know about their health. And so uh, from top to bottom, uh, women have played a very integral role from the onset. Uh, we, again, prior to COVID, uh, had our annual UMM fashion show, uh, which was probably the hallmark fashion show, uh, perhaps in the area on the East Coast. Um, and that show ran for a good 20 years or more. Uh, and the women, you know, the sisters headed that up. They would attract the talent, the vendors, uh, and everything else that you needed. So. Um, I don't want to say that uh, women don't have a role in the masjid and other masjid, but that's definitely not the case at uh, United Muslim Masjid. Women have a very integral role uh, in the activities of the masjid. Thank you, Sanaya. Over to you, Brother Tingi. Uh, I think we are getting to like on some of our questions. I know there are many on my list, but I'll try to restrain myself. Uh, yes, yeah, so that ties into um, overall, we, you touched on some of the resources that, and how um, you have women involved with UMM. And, and more on a more broader scale, just in general, we were going to ask um, if there were any specific notable events, lectures, or um, initiatives that UMM has that our audience watching should be aware of and look into after the session has concluded? Well, we're always constantly uh, fundraising. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at how are we going to fundraise and present during uh, Ramadan. And so you can look forward to a very um, robust fundraising program uh, coming uh, this Ramadan. Um, and we've also worked in combination or coalition with uh, Sister Claire Muhammad of Philadelphia Masjid in raising funds and helping to develop their new gymnasium uh, over there as well. Um, our plan is that we have uh, exceeded the boundaries and limits of the buildings in which we reside. And so we're coming forth with an expansion plan that will accommodate our burgeoning numbers on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're looking for space. And in that space, we want uh, a musalla, classroom, offices, utility, uh, spaces for our, for our elderly and space for our uh, youth with uh, perhaps parking in a playground, uh, all in the same building or buildings. Now, because we have been so successful at uh, cleaning up the neighborhood, it's almost outpriced us in our own uh, geographical region. Right. The, the, 
the building space in South Philly is, is just really frighteningly um, overpriced. Uh, and so you see a lot of gentrifiers and speculators coming to town and just buying and flipping. You know. But that is uh, pretty much you know, what we're, we're the direction that we want to go. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Seth. Inshallah, that, that you, you will be facilitated and, and, and your job will be made easy. Um, if there are any questions, please, um, we ask you to put it down. Uh, Brother Francis Mohammed put down um, questions, noting that he is with the African American Genealogy Group and that they are trying to conduct virtual workshops utilizing religious records. Um, uh, and is inquiring whether there are any records within the uh, Black American Muslim traditions um, that could be useful for such research. Um, I'm not immediately aware, but but we'll, we'll be in touch. He kind of put, uh, sent an email to me uh, and I'll be happy to connect with him, uh, with you as well, with the custom stuff, custom sort of, you know, um, perhaps, you know, the conversation can get deeper. Um, one question that I been you know meaning to, to ask was you have alluded to your Hajj the two Hajj um, uh, visits that you were blessed to do one was if I am not mistaken ninety three and the other one two thousand and seven eight two thousand and eight um, uh, and and I think you know you mentioned that you went with with people uh, from Masjid Mujahideen. Um, yeah, Imam Asim, uh, you know, which is kind of, you know, almost like a home base for Majid Shura, mashallah, uh, and many others. What were some of the, the differences, you know, that you may recall between the 93 and the 2008 uh, trips, both in terms of, you know, Hajj, but also I am talking about, you know, reaction to American Muslims um, being there, going with, with the Philly uh, crowd and, and others. Um, that's uh, because you know those kind of connections are, are often you know underexplored. Uh, so I wanted to, to ask you a little bit about your insights um, regarding that. Well, when I made Hajj in '93, you see those old pictures of Mecca with just the Kaaba and no buildings around it. I think it was kind of similar to that situation. Um, you know, when you uh, get to Arafat. Uh, you have to um, you had to set up your own tents and you had to do a lot on your own and you had to facilitate yourself a lot. Whereas in 2008, a lot of the accommodations were, were there and waiting for us. It seems as though that the government of Saudi Arabia had become more adept. Um, the, the space in the Kaaba or the Haram had grown threefold and I'm sure even now. Now they have a monorail system. Uh, I think they were a little more old school out of the tradition for the Sunna is what, what kind of held back that monorail, but uh, it, it was not um, a healthy situation when you have all of these diesel buses compact into one area and you're just breathing fumes. And if you're an asthmatic, or you have problems with breathing, that was not the best situation or condition. So I think that the government has done a lot in terms of facilitating uh, the Hajjis. As far as um, my Philadelphia swag <laughs> on Hajj, I remember in, in the Haram walking uh, through the Masjid and uh, some brothers from Um al -Qura came up to me and said, out of the blue, are you from Philadelphia? <laughs> and I was like, really, yes. And he said, I could tell by the way you carried yourself, you know. Uh, and that was, um, he's Imam at the new Islamic Family Center, uh, Imam Ali Davis. He was a student at Umel Qura uh, in 2008 um, when I was there on Hajj and uh, Saeed, uh, his, uh, his partner in crime at the family center was with him and, and some other brothers. So uh, Philadelphia um, has always had a presence, particularly 
with say uh, Dr. Tahir Wyatt. He's been in in Medina for twenty over twenty one years, and so um, he wasn't there when I made Hajj in ninety three, but he was there in two thousand and eight. And from what I understand, what he did for us, he does for he did for everyone. He facilitated the Hajis at least two days uh, in his section of Medina town. He took us, uh, fed, you know, made sure that we were fed. Um, and then he took us on a shopping spree. Uh, he took us to a, uh, a garment, uh, a tailor who makes the thobes, tailor-made thobes, any fabric. He's got all these fabrics hanging up on the wall and you can pick whether you want the Sudanese collar, you want the European collar, you want the cuffs, the cuff links and so on and so forth. They'll make them in any way, uh, any way that you can. And they'll have them ready for you in two days before you leave. You know, and so I, I just remember him. And he also uh, performed Doris. Uh, he sat down with the Hajis and, you know, uh, talked on, you know, Quran, Sunnah, Fiqh, Hadith. Uh, and from what I understand, everyone who's from Philadelphia always got that service from uh, Sheikh uh, Tahir. So there are a lot of brothers who are expats that live in. Uh, Jidda, uh, Medina, and Mecca. I don't know if it's still like that because for an understand they're deregulating and cutting back on a lot of the schools. But in the 90s, all the way to the 2000, 2010s, Saudi Arabia was doing a lot of heavy recruitment of young um, African-Americans to come to their schools. Like I said, Saeed, uh, Ali Davis, um, uh, Muhammad, uh, uh, Shadi Muhammad, uh, Tahir Wyatt, some of these uh, very prominent speakers in Philadelphia, um, Imam Hanif Faus, um, all of them were educated in Saudi Arabia, um, and Ali Davis and Saeed were at uh, Umm al Qara, and the others were at. Uh, Medina in re, uh, the, the university in Medina. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, and uh, wonderful. I mean, these these leaders, you know, have that distinctive, right? So, Philly natives uh, who, who bring, you know, multiple different strengths together. Uh, and what they try to do is establish um, a learning uh, center here so that, because if you, if you talk to them, uh, they'll tell you about hardships that they had to encounter because they weren't from that area and the sacrifices that they made, you know, they're living in a foreign country, thousands of miles from their family. And I say, uh, Sheikh Tahir was there 21 years. He often came home for the summers, but he didn't live in Philadelphia. Um, Shadi Muhammad uh, often came home, but, you know, there was a lot of sacrifice that they made you know, and hopefully um, some of the youth like Sinai can get in the programs that they're offering and they don't have to make the supreme sacrifice of leaving their families uh, behind in order to learn Islam. Indeed, wonderful. So we would keep you here until midnight if, uh, uh, if, if time allowed, uh, you, we are grateful to you for your generosity with your uh, time, with your knowledge, with your sharing your experiences, this rich history. Um, it's, it's, it's an understatement to say that really it's, it's such a rich history that we could, I think, uh, study more seriously and learn from. Uh, once again, we are grateful. Uh, this series uh, started off with a conversation with Abdul Rahim Mohammed at the New Africa Center and a visit uh, that uh, you have walked us through this rich history. Mm -hmm. uh, inshallah, we are, as we are trying to schedule uh, more. Uh, there is next week uh, Imam Kenneth uh, Nuruddin uh, from uh, the Philadelphia Masjid, inshallah, will join us uh, for this series. Um, we are grateful to you, uh, to, to all you do at, at UMM. Uh, once again, the website is ummonline.org. Um, please visit. Um, let's learn from uh, Dr. Tahir, uh, Imam Hanif, 
uh, and the community at large our own brother Carlin Safir one of the starters founders of Care for Adelphia yeah. he's a long time member and the Muslim Masjid board at the same time <laughs> it's wonderful mashallah uh, we always you know when I first joined you know I sat down with him to try to learn um, uh, more and and that's a, that's a continuous process um, Sanai, thank you. Uh, any last words from you or Jacob? Uh, you are with us, I believe. Um, yeah, I mean, I uh, just wanted to express my gratitude and say shukran. Um, I definitely took a lot from this session, and especially as uh, a youthful or a, a youth member myself um, and a younger, younger Muslim who grew up in this Philadelphia community. Yeah, I remember you from your Jawala Scout days. <laughs> hearing, hearing the stories and hearing about um, just the importance of what UMM has done and what it's established and what it's continuing to establish and what Philadelphia masjids and the Philadelphia Muslim community as a whole has continued to establish. It's, it's very, very enriching. Um, and it's it needs to be it needs to be talked about more, especially to my generation, because we have to be able to carry the baton when it's passed to us, and keep this legacy going um, as when when you guys all continue to age, and as we get older, we're we're next in line, and we have to make sure that you know all these accomplishments and all of these achievements that you guys made, all that hard work you put in, that we don't let it go to waste. So I definitely took a lot from this and I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with all, speak with us. Um, Jacob, uh, I believe you wanted to say a few words as well. It's a great um, honor to have uh, Kasim, Brother Kasim as a guest on these webinars. And for those of us who are not African-American, are not Muslim. We are in your debt as a teacher and as a leader in the interfaith movement in this city. And we understand the quote from the Quran that says that human beings are obligated to know one another, to get to learn about other traditions. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to ask a question about how you balance in the masjid the obligation to do social justice and those who say that politics is not necessary, it's an abstraction, it's taking away time from the study. Um, and how does one respond to that um, as the emir in this city, in this um, era um, only a couple weeks out of the uh, regime of the Trumpites. <laughs> well, as we know, the Muslims are, uh, are raised amongst the best. We're the best amongst mankind, you know, um, forbidding the evil and instilling what is right. And so uh, the social justice tradition within Islam is throughout the Quran and throughout the Hadith. And as you can see with organizations like uh, CARE and new organizations such as Engage and so on and so forth that are taking the mantle of the uh, African-American tradition and the Muslim tradition and fusing them together and going forward. I think that Muslims uh, by and large, if you look at the history, um, African-American Muslims, Black Muslims, if you will, or um, mostly African-American Muslims. They come from the tradition of two veins of social justice. Either they were in the, um, the vein of Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Coordination uh, or uh, Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam, which if you, I've interviewed and spoken with um, Bobby Seals, and he said, look, they were gonna join the nation until Malcolm was assassinated. And so they started the Black Panther Party for self-defense. And so when you talk to Muslims who are older than I am, uh, like a brother Sultan Ahmed, uh, who, was, who ran Bobby Seale's campaign in Oakland when he 
almost won uh, when he ran as mayor of Oakland. So social justice uh, for the African American community is nothing is not anything new. Uh, it's something that is interwoven within our DNA. And African American Muslims have been on the fore uh, for social justice since the days of the Nation of Islam. Um, the nation had a different perspective uh, on nonviolence and integration, but they were still engaged in social justice. Thank you, Seth, uh, for that. And thank you, Jacob, for, for, for that question. Uh, for um, uh, Berkats, before we finish, remind us the, your radio show, Islam Today. Oh, I'm Living Islam taking, Today. It's a, it's a Living new Islam show. Today. Yeah, it's, it's uh, on Word, uh, so that our audience can tune in and, and benefit yeah, from uh, the, the rich conversations. Yeah, we're at uh, WRD 900 AM and 96.1 FM and WRDradio.com. Um, and it's myself and brother um, Jihad Ahmed uh, that uh, host and co-host uh, those programs. Uh, I think our last, um, two, our last program was a, uh, a review of the movie uh, One Night in Miami, which I thought was a very, uh, a very critical, um, you know, a very good depiction of several of our heroes. If you don't know, it was about a meeting that took place uh, with um, then Cassius Clay, Minister Malcolm X, uh, Jim Brown, who uh, was a football star and an action movie hero, and uh, Sam Cooke. And so uh, that was a very historic uh, adaption. Um, we did, and then I think last week we had a program on the psychosis of racism uh, with Dr. Malik uh, Rahim and talking about the psychosis of racism, particularly coming off of the storming of the Capitol and how that was really uh, a move and establishment for. Um, uh, white, uh, white extremists, uh, white nationalists, and privilege and racism, all of the things that came about in the Trump administration. So we still are tackling the, the issues of religion and race and how the role that African Americans uh, have played. And I really would recommend uh, for people to watch that movie One Night in Miami. You know, uh, several people say, well, it's fake and so on and so forth, but it's Hollywood. So uh, it's creative license is extended uh, to Hollywood. There's a lot of factual um, uh, representation in that movie about those four uh, dynamic and iconic characters. It was a very lively discussion indeed um, that I benefited a lot from your perspectives, Imam Idris. Uh, to say here, you know, um, his, his perspectives and uh, and it's always a lively show and, and one that brings a lot of benefit. But again, we we will not keep you here until midnight. We want to thank you, Seth, again uh, for sharing your insight, your history, um, and, um, and and your knowledge with us. Uh, we are grateful, and we hope to see uh, and thank everyone who joined us both here on Zoom and on Facebook uh, for joining, for giving an ear. Uh, for your questions and we hope to be engaged and invite you all to our next session inshallah next wednesday with imam kenneth i hope i've been of benefit and anything that i said in error is from me and anything that is truthful or factual is from allah ta'ala thank you so much again we are grateful have a good evening inshallah